My name is David Sankel. I'm at Bloomberg, and we're going to be talking about promises. Um, are you guys enjoying the conference so far? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Like, the conference has been amazing this year. Um, so, I'm just curious just how many of you guys attended the mathematical thing? Okay, a lot of you. Um, so, that was a very esoteric talk. Um, and this is supposed to be an exoteric talk. That's the opposite of esoteric. It means I'm supposed to actually talk about something which is useful um, that <laughs> the day-to-day -day programmer could make use of. Um, so speaking of that, the code for this talk is available here. And actually, we just got the permission to make this open source uh, a few hours ago. And I was able to upload it. So that's awesome stuff. We have an Apache license, um, so you can use it wherever. And you know, at some point, if we want to change it to a boost license, we can look into that. But anyway, there's the code for this talk. The, the, the code itself, um, the main branch is written using concepts. And there's also another branch called C11 that doesn't have the concept stuff in it. Because concepts is a TS, it's not actually part of the language yet. So if you look for the C11 branch to get an actual C++ uh, version of this thing. All right. What's the problem? What are we trying to do here? So the kind of problems that I need to solve relate to code bases that are asynchronous and have a huge amount of code. And with any kind of code base that has a huge amount of code, like maybe if you get to the 100 or 200,000 line level, the big, biggest issue is how quickly can you go in and modify something with this code base? And the biggest part of that is how quickly can you reason about the code? Um, and with the particular code base that I'm working with, it's difficult to reason about the code. Um, it's using, you know, to try to follow execution with an asynchronous application of that size, it jumps from here to there and then back and all over the place. It's very hard to follow the flow of what actually happens when you're reading the code. So that's a big problem. But basically, the way that I would uh, say it precisely is we're talking about the problem of concurrently executing tasks with complex interdependencies. Now, there's a lot of concurrency problems, which you could break them into parallelism problems, to where you know exactly these two things are running at the same time, and they come together at the end, and everything works very nicely. We're not solving that particular problem. We're solving with the complex interdependencies. If this thing happens first, then I'm going to do this one thing and spawn off this other thing going over here, and then it all kind of comes together in the end. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so how is it solved today? Well, how many of you need to solve this problem? Have you guys come across this? OK, almost everybody. Um, the first way that I've seen this solved is with blocking threads. So here's a little snippet of an application. Um, some for loop that goes forever. You get some kind of request, which is coming in through some data pipe, TCP uh, port, whatever. Uh, then you spawn another thread which will look up something in the database based on the request R. So here we're looking up some kind of query that returns an item. This is a blocking call. And then you send a response back to the, based on the origin of the original requester, the data that you looked up in the database. And you just do this over and over and detach these things. Um, so does this seem to be the most, uh, so raise your hand if you see this problem solved mostly with blocking threats. OK, OK, a fair amount, not too many. The reason why I don't think that this is solved with blocking threads is because there's a lot of expenses when it comes to spawning off a thread. I mean, one thing that's nice about this is you can reason about it fairly easily. Um, but spawning off all these different uh, OS threads is expensive. Uh, you have to have an entire copy of the stack. Uh, there's other. OS related things that need to happen in order to spawn off another thread. So it's relatively expensive. You don't want to create threads all the time for every request, especially if you're getting something like, I don't know, 50,000 of them per second. Uh, it, it just, it's not going to work. Um, another thing about blocking threads is it doesn't harmonize very well with asynchronous libraries, which are more and more common these days. Um, if you want to use your blocking thread, um, library or application and then call into some kind of asynchronous application. To get the asynchronous thing to work with the blocking thread, there's a lot of work involved in making that happen. Sometimes uh, asynchronous libraries come with a synchronous version, in which case then you can just use the synchronous version and that works okay. 
but more and more uh, frequently I'm seeing libraries which don't expose a synchronous inter interface. It's just purely asynchronous. And finally, uh, communication between threads is really hard to get right. You have to use things like mutexes to protect data, and uh, this turns out to be a, a common source of bugs. Very hard to find bugs, and bugs that only happen like once every million cycles, and you're just like, what happened there? I can't reproduce it. So that's a problem. Or even worse, someone actually tries their hand at um, lock-free programming, which is just a total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do lock-free programming. <laughs> it's not worth it. Um, another option which people have and is done frequently is with state machines. So how many of you uh, see asynchronous kind of problems solved with state machines? Okay, uh, maybe about a quarter of you. So this is generally how this works. You create some kind of class which represents the state of your system. Um, in this case, we're solving the exact same problem, but we're doing this with uh, a state machine. So the request handler takes in the request. Uh, we presume that the requests are being generated elsewhere and it creates these request handler objects. Uh, sets some kind of member variable and then it does its first asynchronous operation. Uh, here, lookup and database the query. The second argument to the lookup and database function is a uh, continuation function or a callback. This callback takes in an error code and an item and then calls another member function here in your state machine to handle it. So basically, I'm using a lambda here. You could also use uh, bind. I'm not sure if I like bind better than lambdas for these cases, but I'm, I'm just going with lambdas here. Uh, and this is the general uh, way this is done. So this says handle received item. So when this lookup and database thing is done, it'll go to handle received item. Um, it checks the error code. And if everything is good, it'll call send response, which is another asynchronous function, which takes its own call back, which just points back to another member function here, uh, so on and so forth. And if I can, where's my mouse? There it is. Uh, handle sent response is the last callback for this particular example, and it calls delete this to kind of free up the memory. Uh, this is like a very primitive way of doing this, uh, but this is, this is kind of how it works. So there are some nice things about state machines. Uh, state machines are fast, uh, especially when you compare it with the threading case. Uh, this does harmonize well with asynchronous libraries, so like we just saw in that example, you can call into an asynchronous thing and it comes back and that works well. Um, sometimes it can be tricky to follow the execution path because you have a callback function here, another callback function down lower, and sometimes it's difficult to follow what exactly is going on. You can do it, but sometimes it's tricky. Um, and error handling is clunky. You know, having all these functions taken a parameter, then you have to deal with it explicitly every time can be a pain in the butt. So that's the way that that kind of works. Uh, another option is with nested callbacks. This is kind of like the state machine approach. The difference is, uh, instead of making a, a whole state machine, you just put in the callback what you want to do with it. So here we have service.listen, you get some kind of request. We're looking up in the database, so this is the exact same like API that we were using in the previous slide. And we set in the query, and instead of calling a member function as your callback, you just do what you want to do in that callback. Again, we check the error code, then we call send response, and then there we check the error code. So you kind of can follow what's happening uh, in, a, in a sequential way with this kind of thing. So how many of you work with systems where they do this nested callback thing? Okay, so maybe somewhat less than the state machine approach. So one thing that's nice about this is that you can follow the flow in a pretty reasonable way. And uh, one drawback of this is that the nesting can get deep. Every time you call another asynchronous operation, you're nested in a little bit more. And when you're working with applications that are hundreds of thousands of lines, this can be impractical very quick, very quickly. Um, there are other ways that you can solve these problems. There are event systems out there. I'm not going to talk much about those. Um, but the previous ones are usually the most common way of solving the problem. All right. So if those were fine, then I obviously wouldn't be giving this talk. Um, all of these systems have issues when it comes to scale. 
uh, threads, the problem with scaling is with regard to performance issues. With state machines and nested callbacks, the problem with scale comes to the reasonability of the code and, and how quickly you can go in and make modifications to it. Um, a lot of the logic behind the program gets hidden behind all this syntax and nested things and so on. So maybe we could use um, stood future. The crippled stood future. <laughs> The comment was, tell us what you really think. I think it's crippled. So <laughs> if you have the lookup and database function that we were using previously, this is how you would write it with a std future. The result type would be a std future of an item. So instead of taking a callback, it returns a future. The future is basically uh, a data type which gives you the idea that this item is contained by this object, but it may not be available yet. It'll be available, available sometime in the future. And then if you want to use this future, you look up something in the database, uh, pass in the query, you get the future return type, and then you call uh, the future.get to get the item out of it. You can save one line by placing the get directly in the same line. <laughs> <laughs> there was a completely useless comment. I'm not going to repeat it. Um, no, 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 just kidding. Yeah, uh, we could have saved a line by calling .get here and just making this into an item. Yeah. So what? All right. So with std future, uh, we have exceptions for errors. So notice that I didn't have to do anything special for any error handling here. If this future doesn't ever come to be, if there's some kind of a problem, then the get function is going to return an exception. So having exceptions for errors, that's nice. I don't have to clutter the code with all this error handling stuff. Uh, this is still essentially a blocking interface, which isn't good for performance uh, because we have to keep these stacks all around and we're waiting on threads and stuff like that. We'd like to have a more asynchronous friendly interface. Um, and the way this works is you have a std shared future, a std future, and you have a std promise. And uh, there's a set, like a, a set of several different classes that you kind of interact with each other, use one at one place, one or another place, and you do this to interact with your system. Uh, ideally, we'd like to have something more simple and I think we're going to get there. Uh, but I just mentioned that there's a bunch of classes you have to know about when you're using a std future. All right. Is everybody following along at this point? This is pretty easy stuff, right? Compared to my last talk, it was. Sheesh. All right. Uh, DPLP promise. This is our proposal for what a promise is. And this is how you would write this function that we've been writing in different ways using this promise library. So you call service.listen. Uh, and this takes in a callback, which provides a request. So we call lookup and database like we did before with the future, and we get a promise of the result. Then uh, we want to do something with this, so we call dot then on this promise, and then takes in what we're calling a continuation. The continuation has a single parameter here, item. It's always going to be the same thing that this prom prom promise contains. It takes in an item. And then once we have that, we call send response of the item uh, dot data. We are capturing the request here so we can use request.origin. And we'll go into more detail into why all this works and, and what the idea is. So the, the real takeaway from this is it's short, it's simple, it's concise, uh, there's no error handling, and, uh, and that's about it. So overall, Using DPLP promise, uh, aside from concise and error handling, you simply have one type as opposed to multiple types like you had with std future. It only has one member function, then. That's it. So it's very simple to work with. And it has a very powerful uh, abstraction. And the power comes from uh, the denotational semantics that were used to, to create this thing. So it, it does have a certain mathematical degree of power that you can say with assurance about it. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the fundamental operations. Well, uh, on the promise itself, you have a constructor, and you have that then member function. Here's an example of how we use the constructor. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. It takes in a fulfillment function. Uh, here is where we use then, so similar to the previous one. So in this, con this promise that we're defining here, this promise is fulfilled with the value of 5. And here we are creating another promise that is fulfilled with the value of 6 using the then operation. 
And then we have two functions that relate primarily to time. One is called first, the other one is called all. So if I have foo, which is some promise of a string, I have bar, which is a promise of an int. If I call all on foo and bar, I'm going to get a promise that includes a string and an int. And that promise is fulfilled when both foo and bar are fulfilled. And then we have uh, first. So you pass in foo, you pass in bar, and this time it's going to return a promise of a variant with a string or an int, and it is going to return which of foo or bar happens to get fulfilled first. Um, now, the semantics behind this are kind of complex, uh, but you don't really care about that in the normal usage. The normal usage, um, you don't really need to think about it. It works in the way that you would expect. All right. And feel free to a interrupt and ask questions uh, during the talk. I'm totally happy with stuff like that. Yes? Um, for the dot then, um, does the argument have to match up with what uh, was in the promise? Or is there version rules? What about um, loop only type? And all of those. <laughs> So the question was, do, it, with then, does the argument type have to match up what is in the promise? And the answer is, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the implementation does. I'm pretty sure that it doesn't have to exactly match up. It can convert to it. Um, in terms of move semantics, you never move things out of a promise. Once it's in a promise, it's in a promise. You can't move it out. All right. So let's look into more, oh, was there a question? So the comment was, well, you know, here we're distinguishing between the types in terms of which of these happen first, because we have a variant here. What if they have the same type? Well, if they have the same type, you can you, you get a variant of int int or something like that, which is totally fine. Um, but if you want to discard that information, then you could write something on top of this, which just extracts the int out of the variant if they're all the same type, something like that. Another question. Mm -hmm. uh, do I get the reference to the original object or do I get a copy? Uh, the question is, if you have your continuation function take in a reference, do you get the original object or do you get a copy? Uh, I believe with the implementation you get the original object. You don't get a copy. All right, I'll take one more question before I move on. You just said a moment ago that, that you can't, you, you never move out of the promise. You never move out, you got a promise. Uh, so the question, uh, the point, the question is, why do we never move values out of a promise? Uh, and th there are two reasons. One is, in practical use cases, we don't need to. And the second reason is because for the semantics that we want to have for promise, promises are an immutable data structure. So once they're fulfilled, they never change. Yep. All right. So the promise constructor. This can seem kind of complex when you first uh, start working with it, uh, but it gets very easy once you start using it a little bit. So in this case, we're creating a new promise of a string, and we're passing in this uh, resolver into the constructor. The resolver is usually a lambda function. You usually just create it with a lambda, and it takes two parameters. Each of these parameters itself is a function, fulfill and reject. So the fulfill uh, argument to the constructor, this will take in a, a std string. If you call fulfill with some particular string, then this promise foo gets resolved. It has, and now has a value, it's fulfilled, and, is, and it has that particular string in it. Reject takes in an exception pointer. You use this to state or to declare in your program that this, um, this promise, there was some kind of a problem and it produced an error or a failure. So we represent that with a std exception pointer. Why not just throw an exception? So the question is, why not just throw an exception? Uh, 
Uh, well, because if we throw an exception here, we want to be able to, uh, so, so this particular, this, uh, this resolver here gets executed immediately in the constructor of foo. If you throw an exception in the resolver, you will get an exception on the outside. Well, you can catch it. So, I, do an exception so the comment was I could, I could catch it and turn it into an exception pointer and make the promise have that exception. And that is one way that you could do that. It's usually more useful in use cases, and we'll look at them, to have if there's an exception thrown in here, it just this promise never gets created, and you just do something on the outside. And we also want to be able to take this reject object and this fulfill object and move them somewhere else, because we don't always call them in the resolver. And that's where you get your whole asynchronous behavior from. Um, the comment was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the rules are only one of fulfill or reject may be called. You can't call fulfill and then call reject, or vice versa. You just call one of them. And you can only call each of these at most once. So you're either going to call fulfill, or you're going to call reject, or you're going to do nothing. So uh, those are the rules for fulfill and reject. Um, is that and the question, is that enforceable? Uh, it is not enforceable at compile time as far as I know. Uh, nor do I think we would want it to be enforceable. Uh, question? So it could be enforceable if you change the interface. So if you think like it's an unnecessary change in the interface, you could take the fulfill and reject, then from tag, it is able to like fulfill tag, reject tag, and some argument and you forward them to whatever the tag package. And you can still throw them and move forward to the uh, So there was the claim that we could enforce only calling fulfill or reject at most once and I don't see that, but maybe we can talk about afterwards uh, about how that could be done. What happens if you do make a mistake on the call? Oh, the question is, what happens if you do call, uh, make a mistake and call them more than once? Um, well, uh, the default answer is undefined behavior uh, at, at the API level. Um, but in practice, uh, you know, like there's an assertion failure or something along those lines. Yes, uh, there's a comment that you could wrap it up on a call once, and uh, then you can call it as many times as you want, and maybe only the first time you call it has effect. Um, that's another design point. I didn't go for that because I, I think that if someone's calling it more than once, they're probably doing something wrong, so they'd like to be notified. All right. So there are a couple of construction helpers here that are built on top of the constructor. The first one is make fulfilled promise. So this creates a promise in the fulfilled state. Uh, this is actually pretty commonly used uh, as, a, as a helper function. There's a question. Bryce. Is there a reason that to not just have this be a constructor? The question is, is there a reason to not have this be a constructor? And the reason is I wanted the interface to promise to be the minimal complete set. Uh, so these other functions can be built on top of the constructor. Um, for completeness sake, I added make reject promise. So this creates a promise in the rejected state. Uh, pretty straightforward how these things work. Uh, this one actually doesn't come up very often in real code, but it is useful in writing unit tests. So it has that use. Here's an example of this. So here we're calling dplp make fulfilled promise five, and that just returns a promise of an int with five. And it's using the argument to the function to detect what kind of promise it should return. You know, pretty straightforward stuff, kind of like make tuple. And then reject, you have a similar thing, and here we're uh, passing in an exception pointer. You can use std make exception pointer, pass in any kind of exception, and then uh, it creates the rejection promise. Here we actually do need to specify which template uh, we're using because you can't get that from the arguments of make rejected promise. Minor detail. So then is a little bit uh, more sophisticated than the constructor. There are two versions of then. There's one which takes in a continuation function and another one which takes in a con continuation function and an error function. Um, here's an example of then being used. Uh, we call then, we made a fulfilled promise of five, we call then on it. This uh, continuation function takes in an int and returns a string. And then what you get as a result is a promise of a string. Uh, if you want to use the error handling function, what you would do is you would call then with two 
different arguments. One, which handles the case of the promise is fulfilled. The other one, which is the case where the, pro where the promise was rejected. Both of those uh, functions, both of these continuation functions here, have to return the same type value. That's enforced at compile time. So the question is, what if, uh, I'm going to restate it a little bit, what if you call that then and the promise on the left of then gets re in the rejected state because of an exception, what happens with this continuation function? And this continuation function doesn't ever get called in that case, and the resulting promise of then is itself rejected. So just like normal exception handling, if there's a problem, it just gets percolated on until you handle it. Uh, the continuations have some special. So you don't have a dedicated like continuation for rejected. Like I, I would like. Sometimes I have a need to like attach an error continuation, right? An error handler without attaching the factor to the CA. Do you have that in the API or? So. The comment was made is that sometimes it's useful to have an error continuation, but not a uh, fulfilled continuation. And you can implement that using this interface. Um, you just make your continuation function not the identity. Uh, so that might be a nice shorthand, but it's not strictly necessary. You're not getting any new power by doing this. So the continuations have some special return types that are handled uh, in a special way. And we'll look at each of these in turn. If your continuation uh, returns void, let's say, actually, yeah, like in this case here, you want this to, to work. You want this to do something. So we have this idea of an empty promise. So if you have a promise with two angle brackets, that means that it doesn't carry any data with it. It just, you can still see if it completed with an error or not, or when it completed, but it doesn't carry any information. So here's an example, make fulfilled promise of five. Uh, we understand what that does. So we pass in a continuation function which takes in an int, and it just outputs this. This continuation function doesn't return anything. So the promise, this, the result of that then, doesn't carry an int or anything like that, because this continuation function returned void. If you have a continuation which returns a promise itself, then what would normally happen is you'd, the result of then would be a promise of a promise of int. That turns out not to be useful in the common case. You really want to collapse those two promises down into a single promise. So if your, uh, your continuation function returns a promise as this one does, it's returning a promise with the value three, then calling then on that is going to return just a promise of an int as opposed to a promise of a promise of an int. Question? Question, is that lowercase on purpose? The name of the template on the left. This here? Oh, no, that's a typo. Yeah. I didn't know there was a different Yeah, no, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I'm, I'm referring to capital P, so if there's a lowercase p in here, it's, it's a typo. Okay, if, you, if your continuation function returns a tuple, then you're going to get a, uh, a promise with multiple values that are carried with it. So here we call, call make fulfilled promise, and this is how we can quickly make a promise which carries more than one value. So this, the results type of make fulfilled promise of one, two, three would be a promise of int, int, int. I call the continuation function. This will take in three parameters. And then here I just return make std tuple of a comma b, and now we get a promise with two ints in it. Okay, so there's just, there's these four cases that are special. Question? What if the continuation throws? Ah, oh, good question. So the question was, what if the continuation throws? Uh, what do you think would happen? The promise gets rejected. The promise gets rejected, exactly right. Yep. Okay, so now we understand how this data structure works. It's very simple, one member function, one constructor, a couple of basic operations uh, aside from those. Let's see how we would use this in actual code. So here we have some kind of abstract client. It has a connect free function 
which takes in a server address, which could be an IP address or something like that, and it will return a promise of a client, okay, this class itself. That's how you create this class. It's the only way you can do it. And then once you have a client, you can call these different operations on it. So this client is kind of like a hybrid uh, data storage uh, thing uh, with, with a few weird things. But anyway, lookup int takes in a key, which is a string, and it returns a promise of an int. So anytime you're gonna do some kind of operation which is gonna be asynchronous, you're gonna see this pattern. It's gonna be like a normal function with normal arguments, and it'll return a promise for the result. So similarly, we have lookup string. This takes in a string as a key, and it returns a promise of the string as the result. And then we have a, a, another function which is a little bit different, set forwarding status. This takes in a Boolean and returns an empty promise. There's no kind of information it gives you. It just tells you when it's done. So uh, these don't have any like specific meanings. This is just imagine some general class that has these kind of operations that you'd want to use. So how would you put this together? Let's say you wanted to do something with this client. Here we're putting together a few of the different operations that we just learned about. So we have connective foo and connective bar. We know from over here that these return a promise of a client. So I'm using all to create a promise which is fulfilled when both of those connections have been established. And this promise type will be a promise of client, comma, client. So it's a promise that carries two clients with it. Then I immediately call then, uh, which takes in the two parameters, these two clients. So this one corresponds to foo, this one corresponds to bar, that's why they're named that way. The next thing we do is we call return of lookup int forward setting. So remember that lookup int returns a promise of an int. Uh, so we're doing that with foo, and then we call then on that. Now the forward setting is returned from, let's say, this database that foo has. And then I take bar, and I say bar dot set forwarding status to boolean converted of that forward setting. Then return that. All these things are returning promises. On the inside here, this returns a pr an empty promise, which means that this whole dot then uh, expression returns an empty promise. So this is returning an empty promise. Then this then is returning an empty promise. So at the end of the day, we have this empty promise, which is the result of the entire operation. And what you would do with that is maybe you would just do some kind of uh, check for a problem, if there was any kind of rejection that happened along the way, or you'd use that to say, okay, when this operation completes, I'm gonna start working on these other things. So I think this example is illustrative of quite a sophisticated thing going on here. And for those of you who have been working with uh, nested lambda syntax or state machine syntax, imagine what it would look like doing that. You'd have all these functions all over the place, and it'd be hard to follow the logic for the most part. So you can do really powerful things in, in a concise way, and I think it's easy to understand. It's a little bit to get used to it, but once you get there, then you can follow these pretty easily. So, yes, question. Uh, so the question is, what if I have a list uh, of client addresses, let's say, in a config file, and I want to go through them and, and do an operation for each? Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, okay. So if you have like a list of clients or something like that, um, you can write things on top of this, which will uh, create a std vector of promises, for example, and then you can do operations on that. So th there are some higher level constructs that you could build on top of this that would make that easier, and we're actually gonna touch on that a little bit at the end. So let's see if when we get there, if that'll answer your question, what I have up there. Okay, so here is an example of how you might create a server or make the interface for a server with, prom with promises. So in this case, uh, and you can do it in a lot of different ways, uh, this one probably isn't the best, but if we have some kind of a server and you call dot listen on it, and it will listen for an incoming request and handle it and return a promise that is fulfilled when the handling is complete. So this is just hap handling one particular request. So the question is, well, how do I you know, loop this thing so I can listen to a bunch of requests one after the other? The one caveat with promises 
is that you can't just throw these things into a for loop. They don't work that way. Uh, you have to go with recursive functions, recursive-ish functions. So here is a function implemented called listen until an error. So here, the idea of this function is it takes in a server and it's just going to listen to a request, handle that request, listen to another request, handle that request, and if there's an error that happens at any point through this thing, it's just going to return and we're going to be done. So the way that this is implemented, I call s.listen, which returns an empty promise, so I can call then on it. I call dot then, and uh, I'm using the fancy lambda syntax. If you don't have any arguments, you, you can omit the left print, right print thing. Uh, and then I call listen until error of s, which is just calling this function. And then this is how you implement this kind of operation. Um, so someone might look at this and say, wait a second, this is like a recursive function. Isn't this going to kill my stack? Does anybody think this is going to kill your stack? One, one person. <laughs> the comment was yes. Who thinks they can give a good explanation as to why this won't kill the stack? Uh, can you repeat that? The comment is that every continuation function is called in a separate asynchronous context. That's pretty close. <laughs> uh, Zach hit the nail on the head. Uh, this function is not recursive. A recursive function is a function which calls itself. This is not calling itself. What's really happening here is that this uh, lambda function is getting added as some kind of a uh, like to-do list for when this promise gets fulfilled. So it's not going to add another continuation function until uh, the first thing is fulfilled. So you're only going to have one at a time. You'll no you never have a growing stack which is going to do this. Immediately completes, you don't have to prefer the wait so that the then is called in a while on the same thread that you called as listen the then. Would it not be logical? Ah, so the comment was if listen uh, returns immediately, so it's, it's no longer an asynchronous operation, it just it happens right then, and then I call then, this is going to actually call itself and it will become a recursive function. So, yes, uh, indeed, you have to watch out for that. So the comment is, you, you could force then to always post to a thread pool or something like that. And uh, yes, you could. It doesn't entirely solve this situation, uh, but, but yes, I mean, that's one way that you can handle this. Most of the time, this doesn't... Why, why doesn't it solve it? It doesn't necessarily solve it. Uh, the question is, why doesn't it necessarily solve it? Because if listen put something on some other thread pool and it executes immediately, Ace, uh, like in a completely different thread, before this then function actually gets executed, it, you could still have the problem that then realizes that this thing has already been fulfilled. So, yeah. I don't think you want then to be making choices about what, yeah, mechanism of concurrency. So the comment is, you don't want then to be making choices of which mechanism of concurrency to use, and I totally agree with that. Uh, and it doesn't. All right. So, uh, let's say you want to use promises. You're usually going to start out with some kind of asynchronous library that you're going to have to wrap. And here would be an example of this. This would actually be such a nice example if this was like the real world use case. Um, but in essence, they're like this. Uh, so this is just like the client that we had before, except it's a callback interface. Uh, you have this function here called callback connect. The previous one was called connect, and it was just a... a a global function here. It takes in an address. It doesn't return a promise, of course, so it takes in a callback function instead. And the callback function takes in some kind of uh, error. If you're lucky, you get a std error code. If you're unlucky, you get an int or worse. And the second argument is, uh, what is the second argument there? Oh, yeah, this object itself, the callback client. All right. 
Another function, lookup int, takes in a key and it takes in a continuation function. This time it'll take in an error code and the int uh, that it looks up. And remember that it's not gonna call this callback when you call this function. It's gonna happen some point in the future. Uh, look up string similarly, you get a string and then set forwarding status. It doesn't pass in anything except for the error code because there's no information that you get back when the set forwarding status operation is complete. All right. So let's see how we would implement client using this other callback interface. The first thing is you have a private constructor which takes in the callback client because we're gonna use that internally in the implementation of this function. And it's going to store that into a member variable called m underscore callback client. Let's see how we'd implement connect. So these, all these, whenever you wrap an asynchronous library, all these things tend to look the same. Uh, and we'll, we'll see it with a couple examples. So the first thing you do is we're gonna return a promise of the type that we want. See, we have the return type promise of a client, so we're gonna return one of these, and then we create our resolver function. In the resolver function, you actually do the thing that you wanna do, uh, which is calling callback connect, but because we have the resolver function like this, fulfill and reject are now in scope. So it's actually really convenient to use this uh, as an interface, and that's why we do it this way. Uh, and like the question was made before, like, well, what if an exception is thrown in this resolver right here? Well, that's great. Callback connect throws an exception. It had some problem before it even got into the asynchronous operation. That'll just get right through the constructor, right through connect, and right to the client code, which called connect, which is exactly what you want to have happen. Um, so we call our callback connect, and it takes in a server address as its first argument. The second argument is the callback. So we give it the appropriate uh, type here, so it takes in an error code and it takes in a callback client. If there wasn't an error, then we call fulfill with the client initialized to, uh, with initialized uh, with the callback client. If there's, if there is an error, then we reject it and we make an exception, uh, which creates an exception pointer. We use std system error and convert that error code into a std system error exception. And you do it like that. So, Another example, lookup int, works exactly the same way. You need uh, to have this function return a promise of an int. The first thing you do is return the, the, that value and you initialize it with the resolver function where you have a fill and reject. You do the thing that you wanna do, which is the underlying callback interface inside of that function. Uh, here we call lookup int with the key, again, returns back an error code and int. If there's no error, we call fulfill of i. Otherwise, we reject it with the, with the exception pointer. Question? So we're making a, defaulting this copy when we can't get a line, but that's because we want to make copies of fulfill and reject rather than take them by reference. Is that the? So the comment was, uh, we're you, and, and a very good point. The reason, the question is, why are we using equals here and getting copies of fulfill and reject as opposed to taking references to them? And the answer is because of lifetime issues. This callback will be executed after this lookup in returns. So we can't do that. And, and I should mention about this pattern. In the resolver function, you can use and there. It's totally safe. Because we know that the resolver function is being called immediately in the constructor. So generally when you have this pattern, you'll have this is ampersand, this is equals, and and that way you capture the things. If you need to capture more things, you can you know, call them out by name, but generally this is the way it works. Any other questions on this? We'll look at one more example and we'll see how similar these are. Um, so this is set forwarding status. The only difference between set forwarding status and the previous one is that the promise is an empty promise which we're returning. So we initialize it with an empty promise. And here where we call fulfill, we just pass in left print, right print, we don't pass in any data. So that will fulfill the empty promise and this will reject the empty promise. So wrapping one of these asynchronous libraries, you just do this over and over and over again to get your, your nice promise-based interface. A few things should be mentioned about a, uh, a single callback systems. So, 
sometimes you get an asynchronous library that doesn't uh, allow you to pass in a callback for every operation which would have some kind of a result. You set one global callback and then call these operations and then it'll call that other callback with different, uh, different values and you gotta try to figure out which one corresponds to which thing. Uh, these are kind of annoying to use um, and they're not as simple as the other example that we just looked at. So we're not gonna look at this in, in detail, but I just wanna give you guidance in terms of how you would take one of these libraries and map it into a promise library. I, so what you do is the global callback, you need to keep some kind of a registry which keeps track of like for a key, if you get this kind of uh, piece of information, then you know it corresponds to this other um, operation which I did earlier. So if I st start an asynchronous operation, I'll usually get some kind of a key value from it. And then I'll have to have that in, in a map which maps that to the fulfill and reject functions for that. So in that global callback, you just do this um, keeping track of these keys and, and when you get the callback comes in, you look up in the map and then you call the corresponding fulfill and reject functions. So that's how that works, more or less. All right, any questions on that? Question. Uh, do stasable and network in CS instead of trace, which allows the automate creation of such uh, wrappers or promises? Did you try playing with those? Uh, the comment was that ASIO and the networking TS has created traits as a means to uh, create promises directly out of the library. And yes, I have played with those. Uh, I, so the idea behind that, and we'll talk a little bit about ASIO later, but not this particular topic, so I'll mention it now. Um, if you wanna make a generic library that can be used with all kinds of things, you can use it with callbacks, you can use it with promises, you can use it with whatever. Um, all of your operations are template operations, and the second argument is called a completion token, and the completion token gives a hint in terms of what that function should actually return. And we looked at this, and we found it to be uh, pretty hideous, actually, in implementation, and, and very hard to work with. So if you're developing a you know, large-scale infrastructure like we are, uh, the preference is, is to make a decision and stick to it for your interfaces, and then you can get simple interfaces everywhere. But for wrapping uh, ASIO, it's a, a convenient way that you could wrap it. Yeah. I was <coughs> Uh, so the comment was that in the std future slash std promise world, you have these two separate structures, um, and here we're just using a single one. What's the motivation for doing that? The motivation is based on use, uh, because it makes it very easy to wrap callback libraries. Uh, and also the simplicity of it, you're just having one type as opposed to many. Uh, so this is a little bit of a long but it's a question or comment, but it, it's related to that. Would you rather me hold it? Go for it. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine on time. Uh, so so I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I actually feel like uh, with like a couple of very small tweaks, you actually have the future and the promise. Like you're still like they're actually so close. So so the type you're calling a promise, I, I don't think you call it a promise. I think it's just called a feature. Um, it, it is it is a feature thing. There is a promise here. It's hard to think. You have one of your constructors. Yeah. Yeah, any of those. You're we're constructing a promise here. There is a promise here. The promise is the argument tuple to the lambda you're passing into the constructor. So 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 in, in a C plus 11 model and, and, in, and in the general future promise literature around like concurrent systems, right? You have a promise object with a fulfill method and a reject method, right? You can imagine in your constructor argument passing in a promise object with those two methods rather than two callables, right? I, I don't have any preference one way or the other, right? Like I don't, that's, that's not actually I think the important part. I really like this API, like for how you can structure and manipulate the things. 
But actually, since the nomenclature would be more clear if, if you called this a secret, right? Because you, you fulfill a promise. You do not fulfill the sin you're calling promise here, right? You fulfill this argument inside the land. And that's the right place for it to be. I just think that the names would be a little bit more clear. Like, do you want to use an object called a promise or two closures? There are a bunch of questions. I will point out if you use an object and you have a fulfill method, then you can put an R value ref qualifier on it and it becomes straightforward that it can only be called blank. And, and you can put an R value ref qualifier on the reject and it even becomes obvious that you can only call one of the two methods, not both, and you'll get type system checking for that. But um, it might be too verbose. Like, it, this might just be better for convenience. Uh, so there were a few comments there. I'm going to try to get the key points that I took away from it. One is that in the previous incantation of stood future, stood promise, um, this, these two things put together is pretty much what the promise was. And that's absolutely correct. Uh, the other comment was, maybe we should call this thing future as opposed to promise. And I knew that was going to come up. So thanks for bringing it up. I really don't care. <laughs> um, the reason that I call this promise is because it looks a lot like uh, JavaScript promises, and they are called promise there. Uh, so it kind of match that, matches that model. And the reason why I don't care is because nobody uses stood future instead of promise because they're so crappy. So <laughs> I don't mind bringing up something new, but I totally don't care about uh, the name. I would never like put my foot down on that. Yeah, so the C++ design came from the Java literature. This design is much more related to the JavaScript stuff. So, but good, good point. Uh, it seems to me that the difference between the JavaScript one and the C++ one is that there. On JavaScript, you can't dot there. Uh, the comment was that the difference between the JavaScript one and the C++ one is dot get. Uh, in the JavaScript one, you can't do dot get. That's absolutely true. So it isn't All, a future value. Uh, so it isn't a future value. Okay, interesting point. Uh, I'm going to do a comparison to the C++ one, I think, later on. So we, we can talk more about that then. Okay. So here's a complex example that we actually encountered. And I, and I think that it well, it, it kind of solidified in my mind that we hit the right abstraction here. So Zookeeper is a library that uh, represents a distributed file system that has special properties for configurations. Um, that doesn't really matter. What really matters is zoo a get children too. This was the most gnarly function in the zookeeper library. And it's asynchronous. So what it does is it takes in some kind of a handle, it takes in a path, and then it takes in these two callbacks. Let's talk about the second one first. Completion. What does it do with this thing? Well, It'll pass in the return code, so it's an int, boo. Uh, it, it passes in a vector of string, which represents the contents of this path. So if you do a file system and you type in ls, you get a list of children. That's what that is. And then you get stat, which is um, information about the path itself. Maybe it'll have how many things are in it, uh, special codes, things along those lines. So you get these three things, and that's the completion. That's pretty straightforward. I think we understand how to do a promise with that. The other thing is this funky watcher. And what watcher does is that callback will get called when the information that it passed to you in the completion is out of date. So this is useful to make sure that you know, you know when you have stale information. And you do this all with just one operation. So it's very nice. It's a beautiful system. But this is kind of complex. So does anybody have an idea? what the interface would look like of a wrapper of this function using promises. Does anybody want to give this a go? It's all right if you can't think of this offhand. This, was, this actually took me a little while to figure out. But here's what it looks like. So we, we're calling it get children because zoo a get children too, come on. Uh, so get children, it'll take in the handle and it'll take in the path. And then it returns a promise, obviously fitting our normal uh, way of doing things here. The promise itself gets three things. And not any of them are the error code, of course. 
The first one is the vector of string. That's a list of stuff. The second one is the stat, the information about the path itself. And the third one is, an, is another promise. And that promise is fulfilled when the data is out of date. And this actually works very nicely when you try to use it. Now, an alternative is we could have had get children return two promises, one with the string and the stat and the other one with just the empty promise. But this actually represents the semantics much better because we know that this promise is never going to be fulfilled until after this one is fulfilled. So that worked out quite nicely. And I think that they would have tried to do that same thing here with the callback interface, but it would have been way too complex of, of a type for them to work with. So they were kind of limited by this uh, interface, and that's why they had to go this way. But we can really represent the, the thing we're trying to represent with that, the promises okay. here. Do you have an example of use of this? Uh, the question is, do I have an example of use of this? I do not have an example of use of this in these slides. Can you like, but, spell it out? Uh, can I spell out the use of this? I really can't. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the question is, in the previous example, uh, could they notice, notify me that things have changed and things have changed again? No, the semantics of this function is it will only call this callback once. Yep. Another question. Um, you lose names. The, like that vector string, you said that's, this is the children that get returned, but you never get to name the children. Uh, the comment is that you lose names. The vector of string children isn't named. Uh, and in the previous example here, it wasn't named. It wasn't named. So I guess we're not losing names. Uh, <laughs> but do you notice that? Like, do you, does that turn into a problem? Uh, do does it turn into a problem? It it doesn't because usually the the first thing that I do when I call uh, something which returns a promise is call that then, and then I give everything a name, okay. right there. Uh, and and then you can look into the documentation for the semantics. Uh, if we really wanted to have names with these things, this could have returned some kind of a struct with these three things in it, and that would work just the same way. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite. I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand that. Okay, so the comment is, why do I need the third uh, empty promise? Why don't I just reject it in the case that it fails? So this, this isn't here to represent that there's some kind of failure. This empty promise is fulfilled when this data is no longer accurate anymore. So there's no failure going on here. I can get this data, I can do things with it, and then when this, problem, uh, when this promise here gets fulfilled, then I'll have the choice. I can go and get new data, or I can go with the old data for a while. Maybe I want to wait until there's a bunch of requests and pile them up all together. Um, that's, that's the utility of this, uh, this thing with this library. Oh, was there another question? Did it happen that the vector is immediately out of date when your when when your promise is fulfilled, when the out promise is fulfilled, and you wouldn't be able to know if it's true? So the question is, if it was immediately out of date when this gets returned, would that be an issue? In this particular system, that would not be an issue. Um, And that was true before I changed things. When the other promise be immediately fulfilled at that point? The question is, wouldn't the other promise be immediately fulfilled at that point? Yeah. yeah but uh, there, there's always this little extra latency here, and, and that's just how you use the system. That's fine. OK. And, and you'll never know immediately when you have out-of-date information. There's always going to be a latency. OK. So I made an ASIO wrapper, and in that uh, repository that uh, I showed you earlier, uh, in there I have the ASIO wrapper. It's not a complete ASIO wrapper, it's just a, as a proof of concept, but here is how it works. And for those of you who are familiar with ASIO, 
you can compare it mentally to how you would write these similar applications in ASIO. So at the bottom here, we create a TCP server. It takes in a context, which is your executor, that's a lingo for ASIO, uh, and it takes in a listen address. And it calls s.listen, which is what listen is going to do is return a promise of a TCP channel. And once that happens, I call then echo. So what, what the service is doing is it's just uh, listening for something, a connection once, and then handling it, and then exiting. So in echo, this takes in a channel. So remember, we get the promise back from listen. We call that then echo. So echo takes in the, the channel. Uh, we take the channel, we read until we get a backslash n, so we're reading whatever comes in on that TCP interface. Then, uh, and this returns a promise of a string, then we take that string and we call c.send of message. So c is our channel, we can send stuff on the channel. Send is going to return an empty promise, so that means this then returns an empty promise, which means this whole thing returns an empty promise, you get an empty promise, and that's it. So this is a, a, an echo server and using this wrapper on top of ASIO with promises. Does this wrapper do anything more complicated than uh, finding the position token and passing it in differently to all the ASIO's APIs? Uh, the question is, does this do anything more, that's more complicated than uh, passing in a completion token and using that whole interface? I don't actually use the completion token in, the, in this implementation, so it, it looks like a more realistic example. And, Definitely check out the code. It's, it's pretty cool. Any other questions? All right, moving on. So if we compare this to other promise like libraries, uh, you have one type instead of several. There's no like shared future promise in future. You just have one type. Uh, there are no blocking functions like get just then. That's by design. Uh, you, now someone could write a get on top of this if they knew their execution context and stuff like that. Um, I would hope to kind of like push back on that and say, you know, go asynchronous and stay there, it's nice. Um, and that's especially important in like an organization like Bloomberg. We wanna make sure that we have a consistent way of developing applications. Uh, there's the resolver-based construction. So we use a resolver as opposed to having a separate type that we use to, to put in these values. We have this idea of an empty promise as opposed to a promise of void. And the idea behind this is void is not really a type. Void is a keyword. And every time I've seen it used, it's a huge pain in the butt. So being able to sidestep void completely and go with this abstraction instead just works a lot better. And it also flowed very nicely into the multi-valued promise construct. It would be great to have regular void. <laughs> uh, the comment was, it would be great to have regular void. I totally don't disagree. <laughs> The, the problem with regular void, uh, this is kind of a distraction. So there's a language proposal that we regularize void, so void is a type. But the problem with that is that it's a type most of the time. You can't really get rid of some of the legacy things that you can do with the other void. Like if you have a function with, a, with just void in the parens that has no arguments, not one argument. So it's tricky. That, that's C's fault. And the comment is that's C's fault. I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's the way it is. Um, all right, and then uh, we're using direct continuations here. What do, I, what do I mean by that? So with direct continuations, if I want to handle errors, I do it like this. So this is DPLP style. It takes in an int uh, as the first continuation function. This is the error continuation function. This gets passed in an exception pointer. If I want to start inspecting this, I need to rethrow it and then put it into a catch block. There's some extra logic and lines of code that you have to do because of that. In the uh, boost style, then, uh, the continuation function takes in a future, which is itself, kind of, but you get the guarantee that the future is fulfilled, so then you call dot get on it, and then you catch it. This is clearly more concise than this. Uh, but I don't like it for a couple reasons. One is uh, this whole future int thing getting passed in the continuation function. This is kind of hard to understand why this would would be, we're kind of using a future for two different things. Um, I do like that you call get there and if this thing throws an exception you can catch it. But in real world use cases, catching the error doesn't happen very often. So I'm okay with 
spending a couple extra code lines for the error handling stuff. Um, and you get, end up with net uh, less complication uh, in terms of what these callback functions look like. So that's just my opinion. And it seems to work out pretty well. Uh, we can compare these to fibers. How many of you are familiar with fibers? We didn't have a heck of a lot of fibers talks this year, uh, so uh, bear with me. So basically what fibers are, are it's, it's one way of implementing continuations. It's a stack full continuation implementation. So what the client would look like with fibers is this. So you have a connect function and it just returns the client. There's no like returns a promise of a client. You just have to know that this connect function is fiber aware and can be executed asynchronously. And that would presumably be told to you in documentation. My preference is I would like to have it actually showing up in the type system when some kind of asynchronous operation in this function won't return directly. But that's how fibers work. Um, similar with lookup it, lookup string, set forwarding address. In essence, what you get is something which looks a lot like a blocking interface, and that's how fibers work. Um, here's a more direct example. So we have this function again, this DPLP all thing where we connect and we do the, uh, the transfer of the information from one to the other. We set the forward setting based on the lookup into the first client. This is what this will look like with fibers. So the first thing to note is that this whole thing is returning a promise. If fiber, a promise is basically a, a function. So any function with no arguments, you can consider that to be a fiber. So that's how you'd represent a promise in Fiberland. If you want to use the fiber all function, this has to take in two different uh, continue. Uh, basically, you have to wrap up connect in its own lambda object so that it can run these two things concurrently. Uh, here we're using C++17 syntax. And uh, here we call lookup int with forward setting, and that just returns directly the int. If you're using fibers, the exception handling is really nice. You don't have to do anything special. Exceptions work in the normal way. And then we just call set forwarding address. So the code here is certainly smaller than the code up here. There's some additional complication you have to just know about that fibers are basically functions which take no arguments. And uh, oops, there should be a return here. Sorry about that. Yeah, these should be returns. So we have to know that when you pass it into certain functions that you have to wrap them up so that you can do these kind of asynchronous operations. Uh, but the other drawback of fibers is that while it's, they're not as expensive as threads, every time you run one of these asynchronous operations, you have to store the stack. So if you have a small stack, it's not a big deal. If you have a big stack, you have to put it somewhere and then you have to manage that. There is some talk that maybe with some kind of magic compiler stuff, you won't have to store the entire stack and you can reclaim memory and stuff like that. But essentially, you're not going to be able to get a fiber library, which is uh, portable. Uh, and I'm not sure I like it as much. I kind of like having stuff notated with promises. I, I recognize that this is a little bit more clunky, but uh, I think from an engineering perspective, the benefits outweigh the drawbacks with promises versus going with fibers. Yeah, um, so I just wanted to say that I agree with that. Um, I initially, when I looked at these two APIs a while ago, um, I thought, well, that the bottom one allows me to just write super fun, um, mostly super fun. And the argument was that with the dot bands actually it actually tells you domestically where the where the where you are actually yielding um, IP. Right? So you can actually see where the breakups are. Um, whereas here you have to kind of magically know that look up it, okay, I'll do something asynchronous and then I come back there. So the comment was in agreement that uh, promises seem to work out better than fibers uh, because you get a really good idea when these asynchronous operations are happening. You know, when dot then is called, that this is doing something in particular, where with fibers, it's all implicit, uh, even though you have the benefits with fibers with, it looks kind of like C++ most of the time. Any other comments on this slide? All right, moving on. Are promises enough? You know, do we need other abstractions besides promises? <laughs> Gore? Actually, yeah, 
Uh, the question was, in, do we block in the destructor of promise for it to be fulfilled, or do we not block? Of course we don't block. That would be ridiculous. <laughs> Comment? So in that case, if it's been rejected in the destructor, do we exit the process? Uh, the comment was, if it's been rejected in the destructor, do we exit the process? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, so, like, these promises do not care anything about where you fulfill them, where you reject them, whether it's multiple threads or one thread. Uh, they do, they're completely generic with all that stuff. Right, but if you can ignore Oh, the comment was, if you can ignore errors. And, and actually, that, that does bring up a good point. That is one issue with promises, is that uh, if you don't call dot then and have an error handling as, as the last thing, then you're probably swallowing an error. So it's something you have to watch out for. And it'd be nice you know, to have static verification tools that ensure that you, know, you call dot then and have an error handling function if you have a promise which isn't being returned to something else. Or runtime. Or, or the comment was, or runtime. I'm not sure about that, but uh, possibly. All right, so uh, go ahead. And they also have a, an error handler that you can just drop at the end or you can drop it anywhere in the middle. Um, and so that will be your, your, your catch all for not having to remember to uh, uh, in the second you go in, in the middle. So I'm wondering if you if we could, that, that requires some runtime polymorphism, obviously. So I'm wondering if you try to do the firmware at the higher level for you. Um, so the comment was that uh, there's a JavaScript library out there called Promises, which has uh, where you can have dot then, dot then, dot then, dot then. Um, this library actually does that, so we have that functionality. But it also has a way to like dot catch errors or something along those lines. So that's uh, that's something that I considered as a possibility, especially with um, the C++ 17 has an attribute to basically say, do not ignore this return value. So if you have dot then and you have that attribute said you can't ignore this return value, and then ultimately you have dot handle error, and that one returns void or something like that. Uh, that's a possible way that you can get some kind of compile time guarantees or at least warnings when you're not catching the last error. So that's a possibility. I, I'm still not, I'm on the fence on that because I like the really simple design that this has and I'd rather not add a ton of um, member functions, you know. So I'm open to the idea. I think it's a good point. Well, I will say that all the code that I did with JavaScript when I switched to using that library went from that nested thing that the same problem we're talking about before, where everything's a completion and it's a completion. And that flattening out makes it scale at the end. Yeah, and the comment is that flattening out things uh, makes it scale tremendously. And that's what we've seen here. Uh, we haven't had any examples where we're actually doing that, but but I totally agree. Well, unless I missed something, you didn't really talk about scheduling and practice. <laughs> so, you still have ways like, to inject and say your policy. In fact, if you do this kind of test tool, is there any chance that you might have? Uh, so the comment was that I didn't really mention much about scheduling, uh, and that's because the Promise library is completely independent of scheduling, and also because our main use case is wrapping asynchronous libraries that already exist, so they have their own scheduling applications. Um, but I will say that this Promise library, you're not limited to how you want to schedule things. You can have dot then schedule a task on whatever kind of executor you might want to use. Um, we could even build functions built on top of that, like some kind of then free function, which works for particular schedules depending on, that app, on the application you're working with. At any point, did you look at something like the split expected as an alternative to the session based? Uh, the question is, did I ever look at std accepted as a kind of alternative to this? Uh, std expected is a kind of third way of of doing errors in C++, so you have exceptions, you have return codes, and then you'd have expected. Um, the, uh, I, I, I'm aware of expected, expected, but I didn't give it much thought because I think this interface is a lot more palatable for users. 
Uh, if we were using expected, then the continuation would take in some other kind of type as opposed to the type that you really care about, and then you'd have to use the expected uh, stuff to pull the value and the error out. There's a comment for that, like, uh, expected is a really nice return value if you have a separate on error function. So, so a promise to expected is a pretty nice return value if you are using like only attaching an error. Um, so the comment was that if you're only right. doing an error con con continuation function, using expected seems to be to work very well yeah. in that use case. So this exam might be not great, but it kind of worries me that expected exceptions because most of the use cases involve errors being received and they're not exceptional. Uh, so the comment was uh, we're worried about using exceptions because most of the errors here are routine. Uh, in our use cases, the exceptional, uh, the, the error condition doesn't happen very often, so it works out very well. All right, uh, we have 15 minutes left, so uh, let me get through the rest and then I'll take more questions. Uh, so when it comes to promises enough, rewinding way back to when I put this slide up, um, you know, do we need higher level of abstractions besides promises? I believe the answer is yes. Promises can do a heck of a lot and they do a heck of a lot for us, but they're definitely not the end all. There are certain things that are kind of hard to do with promises. So one example of the way that you can use promises to build up some of these higher level constructs is making a P list. So this is a, in, mathematically speaking, it's just a list of values, except that essentially what you have is a, a, a P list is a promise which returns an optional, which if it's none, that list is done. If, it, if it's not none, then you get a tuple with the value and a promise with the rest of the list. So I haven't given this a heck of a lot of thought. I know that this is the right um, data structure here. This expand function, I know that it corresponds directly to this, um, to this right here, but I don't know what's the right interface for a P list yet. It's just kind of experimenting. But where it would be useful would be if I want to have get responses, and let's say you don't just get one response in int, you're going to get several ints over a period of time sequentially, and then you'll get notified when it's done. You could write it like this, and this is built out of promises. Or if you want to have an interface where you're listening, and that creates a whole bunch of channels that happen in sequence, then you can use plist of a channel here. And there are other abstractions that go even higher. There's RxCPP, which is reactive programming. I think there's going to be a talk on that tomorrow. What time? At 2.30. Is it in this room? Uh, I think it's in beta. In beta. 2.30 at beta. If you want to hear about reactive programming, which, is, which has some really cool stuff. Um, there's also functional reactive programming, which is a different take on it. It's based on functions of time as opposed to discrete events coming through. But anyway, promises, they work very well for a ton of use cases, especially at Bloomberg, like we have, they could apply all over the place. But in some specialized things, or depending on what kind of work that you're doing, these other things could actually work even better. And you can build these kinds of things on top of promises, which is nice. So this is the end of the talk. Um, again, you can go to GitHub, check out the Super Promise repository. Um, in there, there's a bunch of sub-modules. One of them is uh, DPL, and if you go into DPL and go to DPLP, that's where the actual promise library is. Uh, that has a very interesting implementation, and it's very well documented, so uh, it's definitely worthwhile to check it out. There's a whole layer, which is just the core promise machinery, which doesn't require anything, it's just the actual state, and then another thing which gives the thens and all that stuff on top of it. So if you want to experiment with making your own promises, you could use the core library, and it'd be very easy to do. Uh, we do have about uh, 10 minutes for questions, so I'll take them now. Yeah, so for the last uh, year, I uh, talked to program a little bit of uh, Go and Docker, and I developed a page for, for the PHP 5 channel. And I was wondering if you have a comment on, on that, on how PHP 5 channels relate to promises, and if you think that these features, that focus, that focus also, or it would be the other abstraction type of uh, so the qu comment was is that there's been some experimentation done with Go's uh, CSP, yeah, yeah. CSP style uh, channels. Uh, 
and how does this relate to that? So I don't have any experience with ghost channels, uh, but I can tell you from channels as a general concept, looks a lot like plist. Um, I don't know, I, I can't really give any, any comment more than that. Uh, the comment was that conceptually channels and promises, you can very fluidly move between them because uh, you can think of promises as channels which just have one value coming out of them. So I, I was looking at the presentation, actually this is a new talk. Uh, we use a script pointer to keep track of the speed of the promise. So every time you have a promise, you can say hello to you. I was wondering if there is any performance concerns with that. Because you get nicer syntax, nicer syntax ability, but in terms of callbacks or into interfaces, you might avoid those allocations. Is this an issue in practice? Is this completely shadowed by network labels? Uh, so the question is, or, or the point was made that a shared pointer is used underneath in the implementation, which implies an allocation. Uh, if you're doing direct callback approaches, uh, this doesn't come up. So is there a performance concern with related relation to this? Um, I haven't done any. Uh, performance comparisons, but just generally, uh, based on my knowledge of the kind of applications that we're doing, an allocation here is is a is nothing for us. Uh, and if they were, uh, all of you, I'm sure, went to John Lakos's talk on allocators, and know that that won't be an issue if you use allocators at all. I'm sorry. Uh, can I show an example with an ASIO server? Oh, can I show an example with the Echo server? Um, if you go to the repository here, that example is in there. So. Uh, I understood continuation at the end. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with your accent. Oh, could, could what happens if the promise is destroyed before the continuation is, is uh, exec, executed, ugh, executed, executed, wow. <laughs> Um, uh, there's no problem there uh, because underneath the hood, if you're making a bunch of copies of promises and things like that, there's this state which is just there. And that's not destroyed until the fulfill and the reject and any promise which is referring to that is destroyed. So there's no, you don't have to worry about those kinds of lifetime issues. Any other questions? All right, I think we're done. Thank you guys.